So Durhan and crew, while we're waiting, just um, encourage people to use the chat box and somebody can maybe try it out. You can send it to one panelist or to everyone and uh, we'll do our best to get back to you there or, or live and we'll get to other logistical issues in a second when, when Durhan, you kick us off, please. All right, thank you. <laughs> Do not rely on me for logistics. I'm the worst person in the world. You <laughs> so, Jerhan, do you want to kick it off or do you want me to start? Uh, we're still seeing a small trickle of people, but maybe we should just get started, right? So I'll, I don't mind kicking it off and then I'll pump it to you because you're going to have to do the heavy lifting in terms of moderating the session. So welcome, everyone. Um, I'm Durham Wong-Rieger, President and CEO of the Canadian Organization for Rare Disorders. And this is our first, hopefully in a series of fall webinars that will really will be focused on how do we get going on the uh, Canada's rare disease drug strategy. And not to be too political about it, but we are delighted that it seems like we've got a pathway that will allow us to continue what we started um, before the election took place and really excited about the opportunities um, for us to look at some different pathways to getting access to people uh, who have rare diseases. So this will be a first in terms of uh, some of the content areas that we really want to explore in order to have a rare disease drug strategy that really will build on a rare disease strategy or rare disease framework itself. So we're gonna introduce some of that. I'm just delighted with the um, group of experts that we've got who are going to present to us some of their ideas in terms of uh, where rare real world evidence has been effective and has been useful, but also some of the challenges we might have in terms of using it. So this is our first webinar really focused on one of those very important content issues. Um, Bill, maybe I'll toss it to you and then I'll come back in to introduce kind of where we are in terms of the rare disease strategy so you can properly frame the people that we're coming on um, or what this uh, the format will be. Excellent. So we've got uh, the better part of an hour and a half uh, this afternoon or this morning. Uh, I, I, just a quick note from um, Durhan and, and the team at Court and Angela. There were over 300 people who registered for this. It's incredible the, um, the interest. Uh, and I think that that demonstrates um, how important, uh, you know, new ways of thinking are about how to collect evidence around rare disease drugs. And, and hopefully it's a way forward that will actually lead to more and better access. Um, we have a couple of slides um, off the top in terms of uh, what happened earlier this week. There was a, an, an election, um, you know, uh, almost same old, same old. We have exactly the same number of seats uh, to, you know, with, with a couple of differences uh, for each of the parties. Um, but really, uh, you, you've got a, a government that's committed to moving forward on, on a rare disease strategy, which is um, incredible. Uh, started in 2019 with, with the budget, um, and two years later, we're, we're now a countdown to 2022, when there's actually a budget allocation of $500 million starting next April. So the time is, is, um, is ticking. Um, and everyone is 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 four square in moving forward on that. Um, a key element of that we're going to spend most of the time today talking about is, and it's something that Kadath and Ness are committed to, 
you know, what is the role, role of RWE in, in actually supporting the rare drug strategy? Um, and I guess this, this slide sort of shows some of the other issues, Durhan, that you want CORE to come forward with with webinars um, in the coming weeks. So, so heads up. Um, I don't know if you want to quickly go into this or, or introduce the panel, Durhan. Um, I think everybody, well, we shouldn't say everybody knows this. There will be some new people here. So, you know, we do know that um, the Liberals in their election platform recommitted to the 500 million per year or $1 billion for a setup. So we're going to hold them accountable to it. But actually, we're not sitting around waiting to hold them accountable. We are moving ahead. And, you know, last time when the announcement was made in 2019, as we know, we kind of waited for them to kind of pick up the baton and say, OK, let's go into consultations. A big mistake on our part, because we spent, you know, more than a year and a half waiting for, you know, action to start until we decided, never mind, we'll just pick up the baton and lead the parade ourselves. And we were really happy to do that. And then the feds did come in last January, March and hosted uh, a series of consultations, which we thought they did a really great job on getting a lot of people involved. And out of it, obviously, I think as Bill indicated for producing a What We Heard report, which for me was a delight because it's one of the few times I've read a What We Heard report that actually seemed to reflect what it was we thought we said. So that's a good uh, sign in terms of where we are, hopefully consensus wise and moving forward. Uh, so we do want to kind of build on the momentum. And as Bill says, the objective is to get us to the beginning of the next fiscal year, April, 2022, where we will have in place, not obviously a full-fledged rare disease drug strategy, but certainly a framework and certainly actions that we can begin to um, to, to move forward. And um, I think uh, we are counting on all of you that are part of this webinar and hopefully will be joining us for you know, the rest of this year and for next year to really help shape this rare disease drug strategy. And from my point of view, to create such a momentum that everybody will have to come on board, including our policymakers. So it's up to us to kind of make sure that we've got this groundswell to push us forward in order to make all of this a reality, because we have to, we have no choice. Patients are waiting and the challenges are there. So next. Excellent. And so this is, we're just gonna introduce the panelists really, really briefly. And the way that we're gonna run this, um, this webinar uh, is iterative and dialogue forward. So if any of the panelists have something to, to, to add, just put your hand up and I'll keep an eye on that. Please use the chat group uh, as best you can. The webinar is being recorded and will be available on CORD's uh, YouTube channel and slide share, share channel. I'll share those links with you later. Um, a couple of the panelists have some slides. Uh, when people aren't sharing slides, we're gonna go right back so that we can actually see everyone and make this as interactive and, and dialogue forward as possible. So I'll, I'll quickly introduce the panelists uh, and, we'll, and then I'll pass it back to you, Durhan, to, to briefly explain why uh, real world evidence is important for rare disorders. Um, and then we're gonna turn it over to, to Tara Cowling of Medilor, uh, Medlior, um, Director and Managing Principal at Medlior Health Outcomes Research. Tara, I see you every CATA symposium. I know one's coming up. I'm sorry we're not going to be able to see you in person with your amazing cowboy hat, swag, or whatever you're going to bring this year. Um, but you always uh, have some really interesting uh, information, data, and experience to, to, to bring forward on this. So uh, thank you. Um, then we're going to hear from uh, Lori Lambert, uh, lead uh, of real world evidence at CATIF. And um, as Lori's been on previous CORD webinars, and it, it was very obvious that you're all in um, as an agency and your experience uh, from Quebec and in the pan-Canadian world is, uh, is, is exceptional. And, and even the fact that you've got a lead and a team that you're building at Cadeth is evidence that we're, that this is real. This is not just talking around the edges anymore. Um, and in fact, it's so real that we've got Craig Campbell uh, with London Health Sciences, and, and Craig's no stranger to people uh, on the CORD webinar uh, as head of the Div Division of Pediatric Neurology um, uh, in Southwestern Ontario. Um, and Dr. Campbell uh, is going to show how and where uh, RWE is already in place in the clinic and, and how that can actually roll up and, and be useful. Um, Sandra Anderson, Senior Vice President of Commercialization and Strategy 
at Inomar Strategies. And again, no stranger to court, a, a regular, regular guest at, at these webinars. Um, and like Dr. Campbell, uh, deep experience actually developing the protocols, working directly with patients and clinicians on programs that do work to collect evidence. Uh, we're also thrilled to have uh, Brad Aylward um, coming at us from, from Halifax. Um, extensive experience actually building the PCPA. Uh, and I understand, you know, a new and board member with, uh, with, with CORD. So um, it'd be great if you could, you know, wear some of your, your previous hats in terms of RWE from Morse, from a payer perspective, but also your new role at, at CORD to, uh, to, to bring that forward. So looking forward to you uh, um, contributing as well, Brad. Um, and everyone knows uh, Durhan, she was speaking just before me. Uh, and in fact, I'm going to turn it right to you, Durhan, uh, for a couple minutes, and then we'll, we'll get up Tara's slides to explain what is RWE, because if we've got this many people on the line, I bet there are a few that don't know it, and, and Tara's going to explain what it is. Yeah, so thank you very much, Bill, for that great uh, introduction. I just wanted to take us back to the rare disease drug strategy. So if we look at the next slide, I think I've got a few slides around it. Um, as we know, um, you know, we um, in 2015, we have produced the rare disease strategy. Um, this was an attempt to try to identify what are the key areas that we need to have um, in terms of being able to advance rare diseases comprehensively. We need to obviously have early detection prevention, a great diagnostic program that includes screening, it includes genetic testing, includes genomics, includes all of the ability to be able to feed that information back to patients. So you have to start with good diagnosis. And I'm just giving you a fair warning, we're gonna have a number of sessions, webinars, that really will dig deep into the uh, diagnostic um, element of, uh, of this rare disease strategy and where we are now and what we need to put in place in order for us to be able to move forward. And the opportunities are tremendous here in Canada. We need to obviously have timely equitable evidence-informed care. And this speaks to exactly why Dr. Campbell, uh, I think has been such an important asset for us in the rare disease community. These are the centers of excellence, centers of expertise that quite frankly, our clinicians have carved out, our clinician researchers have brought in researchers to be able to make, and the neuromuscular you know, disorder is uh, grouping and certainly around spinal muscular atrophy, which uh, Dr. Campbell has been key on, has been such an important asset for us in providing an example of how this can work and how we can rely on our clinicians to actually bring themselves together to create this network. So this is really exciting. Uh, enhancing community support. So this is something that we know, and it really speaks to a couple levels. How do we make sure that there are good community programs in place and that our rare disease patients can access things like disabilities, occupational uh, health therapy, or, or, and also the um, educational uh, programs, et cetera, but also the investment in communities. And that means us, the patient community support programs, et cetera. Uh, access to promising therapies, which is obviously the big focus right now in terms of this rare disease drug strategy. How do we make sure that drugs get to people in a timely fashion to the right patients in a monitored way? And this is a great opportunity for us in Canada, quite frankly, to maybe set a global example of how it can be done well. And finally, to ensure that we are continuing to promote and invest in innovative research. And, all, and that runs through all parts of what we're looking at here, the ability to obviously diagnose and to provide good clinical expertise, you know, built into the research um, that needs to be done in order to, to be able to advance that, but also making sure that we're having the, the ongoing kind of monitoring and post-market support, but also new therapies, new treatments. Um, and it's not just around therapies, I shouldn't limit it to that, but we do have huge research capacities in our clinics, in our academic centers, and we need to be able to invest in them to take full advantage of them to make sure that we're contributing to rare disease advancement in terms of development as well as taking advantage of it. Next. So I won't go into this in detail, but just to say coming out of the consultations that were held last year by um, 
uh, Health Canada uh, with regard to the implementation of the rare disease drug strategy. What we identified in our feedback is, you know, there are 12 steps that we need to, we can engage in that would get us into what I call a jumpstart to the rare disease drug strategy. And some, and you can look at them, I won't go through them. Maybe we just click through them. And I think they address some of the things that we've already talked about. We do want to make sure though, and you'll see right at the top of this one, address the regulatory barriers, both in terms of what we're doing in terms of regulatory approval processes, as you see there, but also to remove those regulatory barriers, especially those that were introduced by the Patent Medicine Prices Review Board in their regulatory up. Um, I think they called it reforms. I, I don't know if they're necessarily reforms, but they were certainly changes to the regulations that, quite frankly, put in much more stringent um, controls around the access to new therapies. So um, some of the things we've talked about is how do we use managed access programs? So as the key component of how we're going to make therapies available to people in a timely way. And this is where all of this comes from. Why do we need real world evidence? We need real world evidence because we're going to be bringing these drugs into, um, into the market to patients, into real clinical use without necessarily having a full knowledge in terms of what you know, uh, the clinical efficacy and the safety is from large trials that we are used to. And we're going to be needing to make them available on a go for it basis. And we keep saying, you know, I mean, COVID was somehow, not to say anybody would say there's good things about COVID, but COVID was kind of a blessing for us. It gave us the example. How can we do this in a real world setting? What was important for COVID? And we've got some Globally, there's a couple of workshops that I'm going to be participating in, and that is around what are the parallels between COVID and rare diseases? What can we learn and how can we expand from, you know, those strategies that we've used in order to get vaccines to people in a timely fashion and using that and how to engage people? So I'll stop there and then turn it right over to back to Bill so we can introduce our speakers. Right on. So I, I think it, I, I, I've introduced the speakers maybe sufficiently, why don't we get right into helping so many listeners understand, you know, what is RWE? So why don't we start there? Um, again, keep the chat group going because we've got an exceptional group of experts on the line. Everyone will keep an eye on the chat. I'll keep an eye on the panel, put your hand up, ask your questions, but really over to you, Tara, um, what is RWD? What is RWE? Um, you know, what's the status? What are the sources of data? Um, how's Calgary doing? But let's stick with the real world evidence. We'll talk about Calgary later. Over to you. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'm really delighted to be here and present from a, a data nerd perspective. I will stay in my data lane, uh, given the co-panelists, but um, there's certainly a lot to, to say when it comes to real world data and real world evidence and, and how it can be used to inform decision making. So next slide, please. Um, so, you know, there's not actually a, a rock hard definition of what real world data or real world evidence is. There's many definitions that are out there and they're pretty much the same. Um, so it's really around data that's collected routinely around uh, patient health status or patient care delivery. Um, so I always think of it as anything outside of the context of a controlled clinical trial. So it's extremely broad what real world data is. It's not new. We've had patient charts for hundreds of years. I think one of the Swedish registries go back to the 1600s. So it's definitely not new. It's just the term real world data is, is relatively new. Um, and there's new sources of real world data now. So the electronic medical records um, is obviously a source of real world data. It's not clinical trial data. It's just routinely collected from people people's visits um, to healthcare providers. There's patient registries um, and their PSP data would also sort of fit into that, that category of sort of longitudinal collection of, of patient level data for a specific population. There's now wearables, um, your Apple Watch, Fitbits, those types of sources can be uh, a useful part of real world data and combined with other sources of data as well billing and claims data. So that would be your pharmacy drug prescriptions, physician visits that get billed to the government, surveys. These are a very, very popular form of real world data. Sometimes they use validated survey instruments um, to look at you know, disease severity, disease progression. Other times they're just more questions around, you know, what, what do your costs look like or how well do you sleep at night? So many different types and forms of surveys. Um, and social media, a lot of patient groups have Facebook uh, pages now. So there are opportunities for collecting real world 
world data. I think when it comes down to real world data and there's such a, a broad and breadth of it, it's really about it being fit for purpose. So what is your question and what type of evidence are you trying to generate and for who? That's really going to direct what is the most appropriate source of real world data. Um, and it could be a combination of these data sources. So next slide, please. So real world evidence is essentially derived from real world data. So it's, it's clinical evidence, but unlike the controlled clinical trials, um, it's specifically derived from real world data sources to become real world evidence. I think what's important to remember when it comes to real world evidence, especially to inform decision making, is that it should still be part of a research process. So you should still have a research protocol that identifies what are your research objectives, what type of data are you gonna use, how are you gonna analyze it, and how are you gonna report it? And that will then give you the pathway to, to then establishing the real world evidence that you're gonna to provide to whoever that audience will be. Um, and having a formality in that approach is really gonna help with the rigor and the validation of that evidence to be considered as a valid form of evidence um, for decision makers. So really important to think about that process of how do you get from the data to real world evidence and thinking about the analysis and the appropriateness of that. So next slide, please. Um, so one of the things you often get asked is sort of what's the difference between, you know, clinical trials um, and real world evidence. So RCTs are still the gold standard for safety um, and efficacy, uh, mainly because they control for all of the variables um, that would potentially influence um, how well that drug is working. So they're done on purpose that way. They are very homogeneously designed with a very extensive inclusion and exclusion criteria for those patient populations. So that if there are changes or differences between the two treatments that you're looking at or more treatments, you know that it's about the treatment. It's not about the population that's influencing that. So they are necessary and they're still the gold standard. The idea is that real world evidence can complement the clinical trial evidence by addressing uncertainties that might arise um, from the clinical trials. And Diane was speaking to that, that, especially in rare diseases, there's a lot of uncertainties that may be there. So for decision makers, what do they do? They have clinical trial data that's not really giving them the full picture. They need more evidence. So some of the key differences, as I say, is clinical trials or RCTs have a very controlled population, similar characteristics. RWE do not. Um, it's the entire population. So it's really interesting if you're trying to look at bringing a new treatment to market. Well, what does the real population look like? Because the clinical trial population may not be reflective of the actual Canadian public population that have this particular disease. Maybe the clinical trial population is younger or healthier or have specific type of demographics, even geographical differences. Maybe they're coming from urban centers and not rural locations. So really interesting to think about how a real reflective population could address some of that uncertainty um, for the, the decision makers. RCTs by their nature um, have short-term follow-up because it's expensive. Um, so RCTs or clinical trials typically run weeks to months our real world evidence can be a decade or decades. Um, so incredibly different, the turn the, the follow up time that you can have. And that's just pragmatic. You can't have a clinical trial run for that amount of time because of the cost and the expense of it. Whereas with real world evidence, you have long term safety, long term efficacy, uh, which can be very, very informative, especially if you're looking at something like an outcomes based agreement or something where you want to follow forward. An, a real world evidence study may be much more pragmatic than doing some sort of clinical trial to assess that. Um, as we've already spoken about sample sizes. So with, with clinical trials, because those populations are usually so controlled, it reduces your sample size just because of that. And then there's the practicalness of patients coming to the, the clinical sites to get that data. RCTs, or sorry, real world evidence doesn't have that issue. So you're able to get much bigger populations um, included in your study. So that can also help when it comes to addressing some of the clinical trial uncertainty. Clinical trials, very specific comparator. RWE, whatever is available. So you're probably going to be looking at more what the real standard of care is when you're looking at real world evidence, because this is how people are actually being treated. Or is it for a comparator treatment in a clinical trial, these are designed years in advance. And so by the time the trial is actually being reported, their comparator may no longer be relevant, or it may not be new treatments have come on the market, they're not included in that trial. And the decision makers like, but this isn't what people are taking, How, what do I do with your evidence? Um, so it can be very challenging from that perspective and real world evidence can address that uncertainty. 
and then just the time consumingness for data collection. With real world evidence, a lot of this data has already been generated. Um, so it makes it much faster in order to um, analyze and report that data. So a lot of differences, um, and you can see how real world evidence can really complement and add to the clinical trial evidence that might be, um, have already been prepared. Next slide. So we often get asked about Canadian data. Um, there's all the forms of real world data, obviously. There's registries, there's you know, social media, there's surveys, there's many, many forms. But one of the most popular um, that we also talk about a lot is the health system data. And the reason we kind of talk a lot about health system data, it's because of the, the validity of that data. Um, because it's routinely collected, it's mandatory data collection, it's standardized, it's structured, this data tends to carry more weight for decision making, especially for reimbursement and regulatory. By no means does everything, but for a lot of research questions, it actually can be a very powerful form of real world evidence to address some of the uncertainties we've just spoken about. So across the country, all that these are my little bullet list there, those are all collected in every province. The problem is we can't pool the data all together because the provinces are all capturing this data differently. So Kai Hai by the Maple Leaf are 37 million people. They actually do have data that can be pooled across the country. That's the inpatient and outpatient data records. So those can actually be reported at a Canadian level. So for a rare disease, you can actually look at incidence and prevalence at a national level. But the minute you want to drill down into things like how does the treatments relate or how do other outcomes, maybe lab data or diagnostic data, how, how does that influence? you're now dealing on a provincial level because that's the only way we can look at that data at this time in Canada. So then your next question is gonna be looking at our beautiful country and going, ooh, rare disease, Ontario, Quebec, big populations, that looks fabulous. But the only issue with those, those particular provinces is that the data is public plan data only. So if your population is over the age of 65, absolutely, those are gonna be a good bet to utilize those provinces because of the volume of, of records. But if you need a population under the age of 65, you might be looking at another province. BC, Alberta, uh, Manitoba, as examples, all have province-wide or population-level drug data. Private payer, public player, out of pocket, it's all in a single drug data set. So you have population-wide data. So that may actually be very useful. But of course, you know, at four or five million health records, is that sufficient for a rare disease? So it really, again, comes down to fit for purpose. What are your research questions and what is the best data source to be utilizing um, for that particular research question? Next slide, please. Just whizzing on through. I see all of my colors have changed. It's quite funny. Every slide, I'm like, oh, look at that. <laughs> Um, it, it's brand new, a little color wheel. So real world evidence is actually really useful across the spectrum of drug development. So it's it, typically we've often thought about it as sort of a post marketing, you know, you the drugs on the market, how's it really doing, but actually it, it fits the entire span. So real world evidence can actually be used well in advance of regulatory and reimbursement submissions, just understanding who is this population, you know, we're developing a drug for what is the burden of disease? What is the unmet need? What is their current quality of life look like? What does the treatment landscape look like? That can inform the clinical trial development because if you're identifying unmet needs, maybe you can actually capture those outcomes as part of your clinical trial. So it's actually very useful to look at it very early on. And then you move into your kind of clinical trial phase. You're going to regulatory approval. You're thinking about your HTA strategy. Again, there's opportunities for real world evidence to be informing a lot of information. You know, we already know for the current treatments, we can, the health system data its best use is utilization. It's not actually set up for research. So there's a lot of limitations on disease severity and disease progression, but we know if you've been to hospital. So the utilization data is actually quite good. So it can already help with the budget impact modeling, the cost effectiveness, the value proposition, and of course the place in therapy. What are the current treatments? How are they being used? And who are they being used? In our experience, they very rarely follow the guidelines. So it actually is very informative for developing your HTA strategy. Um, and then, of course, after approval, and you want that follow up. Now it's on the market. How is it doing? Is the real world safety and effectiveness following what you saw perhaps in your clinical trials? Um, what are the real treatment patterns? Who's actually getting this treatment? Does that follow who you expected that would be getting the treatment? Um, obviously, resource use and costs have those changed. Maybe there's subpopulations that are doing better on the new treatment than you had expected because they weren't included in the clinical trial. 
quality of life, of course, and patient and physician preferences. So there's just so many opportunities for real world evidence to be able to inform um, strategic planning and also an understanding of how um, new treatments um, you know, can really impact patient populations. Next slide, please. So just at the end, and I'm gonna be quite quick because there's better speakers than myself um, to talk about regulatory and reimbursement. But from what we've seen, real world evidence can support decision-making. Uh, the instances in which we've seen it support decision-making, particularly from uh, Cadeth and Ines, has been instances of generalizability. So potentially trials are being done in countries outside of Canada, and they wanna see, well, what does this look like in a Canadian population? As I spoke to before, maybe the clinical trials included, or sorry, the clinical trials included younger and healthier patients, but the Canadian decision makers are going, uh -uh, that's not who's going to get it here. This is going to be an older population or maybe those with comorbidities or complex conditions. How do they do on this particular treatment? Are they going to get that, um, the outcomes for the value that they're paying? And then of course, similarly, are patients, uh, what do patients getting at second line, third line look like? The budget impact model saying second line, third line, because that's all we can afford. The clinical trial had them first line. So again, like does the clinical trial match what we're actually expecting to see in our Canadian population if we approve this to be on market? And again, the standard of care being different from the clinical trial versus what patients would actually get um, in the Canadian health system. From the public payer perspective, we've definitely seen an interest in phase four trials because they're obviously less risk for them to actually see how the patient does before they formally um, approve it and add it to formularies. Very hard to take off once it's there. So they've certainly um, been promoting the phase four trials. From a pi private payer perspective, we've definitely seen a lot of interest in employment related real world data. So things around absenteeism and presenteeism. This is not collected by the health system, but it can be collected through patient surveys and potentially linked to other types of data sets. So really interesting in terms of that particular type of data informing private payer decisions. Um, and then just to wrap it up from the regulatory and reimbursement agencies, they publicly have said their interest in RWE um, is mainly in things like incidence and prevalence. So again, what does it look like in Canada? How many people are being diagnosed with this a year? How many people in Canada have this condition? the treatment patterns, what do they actually look like here in Canada, um, including adherence, because sometimes that can impact the decision for bringing a new drug onto the market because the adherence to the current treatments is not good. Um, and then of course, looking at comparative effectiveness research, how does this treatment actually compare to our Canadian standard of care um, and cost effectiveness, of course. So lots of opportunity for real world evidence to inform decision-making here in Canada and particularly for rare diseases. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you so much, um, Tara, for, for setting the stage. Uh, so we, we don't have many more slides. We've got one more speaker, which I'm going to throw them up uh, when we get to that question. But I'm going to actually ask Lori, uh, who's been having some technical issues, but yeah, participating I very good actively. right now. So now might be the perfect time. <laughs> yeah. So over, over to you, Lori, uh, maybe build on what you've been talking about in, in, in the chat group. And please keep yeah. that up, too. Where, where is RWE in HTA? And just a heads up to all panelists, let's try to uh, stretch out the acronyms when we first say them. So Health Technology Assessment, HTA, Chi High, we love Chi High, the Canadian Institute uh, for Health Information. So tell us more about RWE and HTA, Lori. Yeah, so I thought that um, I'm hoping there's lots of patient groups on the call. And one thing that I thought would be worthwhile after all the information we received is what is HTA, right? So HTA is Health Technology Assessment. And what CADETH, its role, so Health Canada has the role is determining that risk benefit balance, right? So is a new drug that wants to enter into Canada or do the benefits outweigh the risk? The role of CADETH in Health Technology Assessment is what is the value of that drug in the real world setting? Right, And so we're trying to determine value, but we're trying to do it from all different points of perspectives and all points of and different decision makers. And I always like to point out that, you know, Health Canada is a decision maker, but then provincial payers are decision makers and have to decide, does this drug, do they want it in their province? A hospital has to decide, are they going to start offering this care in this hospital? Or do they have the human resources, the structures, the processes to do it? 
a healthcare provider has to decide based on the evidence I have, is this drug right for my individual patient? And even if the clinician believes, yes, this is a good, you know, a beneficial drug for you, the patient and their family still has to decide, you know, again, knowing the evidence, here's the benefits we know about, here are the safety issues that we know about or that we don't know about. Um, do you want to accept to take this drug, right? So there's all sorts of different decision makers who have different needs and different priorities. And health technology assessment tries to put all those stakeholders around the table and make decision and inform those decisions. So to provide data or information to help all those different players make decisions. So I think, you know, that might be the most important thing that I can bring to the table today, you know, to, to understand that role. And I think if you understand that, you can see how real world evidence, how important it is. You know, can this drug work? Can the people who need it in Canada, can they get it? Is there somewhere they can go? You know, um, in the registry, for example, for cystic fibrosis, they pointed out on average patients are traveling more than four hours to get their treatment, right? So that affects the value of a treatment. So I just wanted to show, uh, talk, you know, to, in my time, the complexity of what we're trying to deal with. And that's why we're trying to have a multi-stakeholder approach. We're trying to be really comprehensive and often real world evidence is about filling those gaps that the randomized trial didn't fill, right? So how does this drug work in children? How does it work in the elderly? How does it work in the more sick? How does it work in the less sick? So just to point out all the complexity, but also all the potential uh, that real world evidence can provide. So I think I might stop there and I can keep just chirping in while other people are talking, but I just thought that might be the most important message from me. Durhan, you're back on screen. Do you want to, any follow-up for Lori or do you want to throw it to Craig and, and find out how RWE is actually being collected in the clinic and hopefully being used by people like Lori? Oh, you're on mute, Durhan. There are some uh, great uh, lines of conversation that are taking place in the chat. So I think we can come back to it because um, I think um, Carol Bradley Kennedy raised a great question. It's a bit of a chicken and egg, kind, right? Because if I can't get access to the drug, I can't get real world evidence. But, you know, if we don't have enough quote evidence to make it available, I do think what, um, what we're trying to do in this rare disease drug strategy is really to be able to ask, you know, if Health Canada says it's efficacious, and it's, you know, we got sufficient safety data, what population should be able to get access almost immediately so we can begin to generate that and which one should we be putting into more monitored programs so that again, we can generate that evidence under very much of a real world scenario. So I'm hoping this is something that Craig can talk to because I know this is exactly what they're doing. So great time to throw it to Craig. Dr. Campbell, chickens and eggs over to you. What's happening in London? <laughs> Thanks so much, Bill, and thanks to um, our colleagues uh, for for those um, launching this this off and touching on some of those important concepts. I am a little frozen here. I don't know if you can hear me, but I can't. It's telling me I can't um, share or either turn on my video or share my screen. That those have been host disabled. I did have a few slides and as Durhan, oh, oh, great. Uh, someone heard my message out there. Uh, <laughs> um, oh, no, still, um, unfortunately can't share my screens. Uh, try one more time. Um, but I, you know, uh, just by way of introduction. Keep trying, now you can. Oh, okay. Oh, great, perfect. Um, wonderful, thank you. 
Um, so hopefully people can see that coming up here. So um, really thrilled to be here. Uh, as as um, mentioned, uh, uh, I'm a pediatric neurologist here uh, at the Children's Hospital in London, but really uh, I get tapped on the shoulder, I think, by uh, Bill and Durheim um, because of my role in, in the neuromuscular disease registry here in Canada. And that's a registry now with uh, almost 6,000 patients uh, enrolled across Canada uh, in multiple sites. As well, um, globally, I am the just the recent past chair of the Treat NMD Global Registry, and and um, so so I want to just share those experiences a little bit. But first, a high from the Canadian Neuromuscular Disease uh, Collaborative um, uh, that make up our registry. Many many people, hopefully some familiar faces. Uh, to you. And just to give you a sense of the scope at the global level, um, you know, for a while I was in charge of, of, of many, many dozens of registries that align under um, our umbrella at Treat NMD, all uh, working obviously in the rare neuromuscular disease space. And again, I apologize for the acronyms, but uh, things like Duchenne muscular dystrophy, spinal muscular atrophy, myotonic dystrophy, um, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And you can see the number of registries that align with us and that we try and provide uh, direction for and, um, and, and push towards best practice uh, and, and some impact. And I want to show you about some of that. We, at the global level, we, we work in a kind of a spoke and hub model here, and we have clinician entered databases and patient enter databases or dual function um, uh, registries. And, and so, you know, one of the first questions Durhan said is, can we talk about, you know, what is that experience of implementing a real world um, uh, evidence framework for rare neuromuscular uh, disease. And so um, uh, we, we have done that. We, we in fact have gone um, in the Treat NMD Global Registry from using a very parsimonious data set shown here on the right-hand side in SMA to say, you know, how can we respond now to a scenario where we have, uh, I can't even believe it sometimes when I say it, three drugs approved for SMA in, in many countries of the world. Uh, how can we um, fill in those real world evidence gaps um, and, and transition from what was a, a, a modus operandi of clinical trial planning uh, to real world evidence. And so we, with many stakeholders involved, uh, evolved our data set to look something like this. And I won't go into it, but you can see, you know, here now to address you know, sort of real world evidence with, with therapies in play, we, we obviously really had to expand our data set to many more items um, and, be, and be very thoughtful about our, our objectives. So what does that look like now? Well, I just wanted to give you a sense of the experience. And I apologize, some of these images are a bit fuzzy, but just to give you the scope now globally, uh, as of our last uh, data poll, we have almost 5,000 spinal muscular atrophy patients around the world who are, who are being followed in one of our neuromuscular disease registries. And we can look at those in, in various ways. And I'm going to show you some of those. One is, you know, is sort of world maps showing where therapies are available. Um, and um, and, and uh, so that gives us a nice snapshot of, of you know, what, what access is like to therapy. We can look at it by our compliance rates to uh, the data sets. And these are, you know, again, I won't go into the details here, but we, we have data sets that have mandatory items, non-mandatory items, and uh, total compliance. And you can see with, with a large number of registries, almost 30 registries, the, the kind of um, alignment uh, with our core data set project that we've had here in the you know 80 plus percent um, alignment even with revisions here and and at the bottom you, you know we can we can show um, you know types the SMA by type um, uh, by you know how the registry is reported we have data on outcome measures so all these things can help inform those gaps that we're we're looking for and so um, you know so we we've had a good talk from Tara about, you know, where real world evidence comes from. And I, uh, you know, I'm going to skip over the more traditional ones, the drug specific registries, which we know have some issues, regular pharmacovigilance. And I'm, you know, I, I'm, uh, uh, you know, wanting to 
compel people to understand that I think academic and patient advocacy driven registries are really where we should land on this. Um, they're driven by the disease community uh, and, and other proximal stakeholders. The data collection is for a wide set of patients, but also open for viewing, which isn't always the case with some of these other ways of collecting real world evidence. And of course, sustainability is all, always an issue um, and, um, and publication of data limited by funding and commitment. But I, you know, I think ultimately there's many people in this space who want to generate real world evidence at, and we have to keep forcing people back towards the middle because what happens is everyone you know wants to collect their own things so what you know what makes it work what gets us back to the center of an effective real world um, evidence source in rare disease well i mean aside from all those uh, things about collaboration and cooperation communication which is where you know cord always um, pushes us to be better uh, citizens in this rare disease space. We need that kind of, of tone in the discussion. But really, uh, you know, we continue um, to, you know, have to look at ways to make it work and make it sustainable for these uh, rare disease, um, real world evidence sources. And I think, you know, continuing to have a disease community approach. And I, I know um, it's been a very healthy approach from the European Union uh, to, to um, get a move away from drug specific registries and be asking pharma to engage with their academic colleagues for disease specific registries. I think that's where we have to go. And, and that's what's really prompted a lot of the success at the global level. We need to continue to work on data harmonization. Tara talked about this. Um, it's, you know, it's super important. I'm so glad that she had up that slide of all the provincial uh, health data and national health data. Our real world evidence sources in rare disease, we have to find a way to link those and create, uh, you know, fair data principles around that. We look to uh, agencies to provide funding for these real world evidence sources, seed grants for registries to start when we see that there's a, you know, a, a drug potentially working its way through the pipeline gap funding to sustain them, and a mixed funding model where industry puts money into academic registries and, you know, and sort of moves away from that model of drug specific registries to support something that has a wider data set for us. And then I look to, um, you know, CADF, Health Canada, other regulators to really put a qualification process in place for us as, you know, as clinicians trying to and, and patient organizations building these registries to help us say, here's the tools, here's the measurements, here's the metrics that we want to see from you as a, as a real world evidence source. And, and I think that alone would go a long way to sustainability and really showing that these are valid data sources to fill gaps. It's not the be all and end all. I see in the chat, there's lots of limitations. Don't get me wrong. I, I recognize that. But the, these data sources can fill uh, very important gaps um, that we have. So I'll stop there and just uh, thank uh, Cord again for having me here and all the team mem members who make these uh, things actually um, actually work. So, uh, so I'll stop sharing. Thanks, Craig. That, that was fantastic. Um, and, and it's a great segue into our, our next speaker too. I mean, you talked about disease registries as opposed to drug specific registries. Uh, Sandra, uh, with, with Inamar, you've got extensive experience going back decades now building support programs to help patients get access and you've been collecting the data around that. Um, do you, I mean, I can, I can put up your slides now, maybe you can walk us through how patient support programs um, can be integrated with some of these other databases and used to support um, reimbursement decisions and, and fundamentally access. So um, I'll, I'll pull my slides up again and... Thanks, Bill. Yeah, no problem. So thank you for the previous speakers. That was great setting the stage. Um, I was gonna focus specifically on patient support programs, but to Bill's point, uh, patient support programs are part of a larger ecosystem of data, right? They're one source. 
um, with a lot of rich data, but 100% it needs to be complemented by the other sets of data that Craig and Tara certainly walk through. So if we go to the next slide, you know, through our ex years of experience, we do run a lot of patient support programs, about 100, over 120. Um, and there's a lot of unique opportunities to, co to collect data from these programs. Through our, through our years of experience, we've learned that a key component to launching a successful real-world evidence strategy is really to work with our manufacturers at the beginning to ensure that there's a robust plan um, and you know, that we're collecting data on behalf of all stakeholders who will leverage the data. So there's multiple sources, as I mentioned, and one of the first actions we do with our customers is really talk about what are the types of data that they want to collect, what is that roadmap throughout the patient journey, and then you know, developing solutions. So on the left side there, you see the types of things we're working on in patient support programs. When we do enroll patients into the program, we get a lot of volume because patient support programs are there to help patients access their drug. So there's a high percentage of enrollment and there's an opportunity to consent and register these patients. When we're consenting them, we're allowed to collect data. And I'll talk a little bit about those details of what types of data, but there's a huge opportunity to collect baseline data, um, claims data, special authorization, reimbursement criteria, even down to reimbursement, dispense data, wholesale data. And what we're trying to do is create different mediums to collect that data, to make it more accessible for patients, whether by phone, by digital portals, et cetera, um, to be able to collect it and have it in one place and, and apply a master data management protocol so that we can analyze the data holistically in an aggregated way. Um, a lot of the investments we've been making are on the systems because trust in the data is, is critical. And so when we collect the data, once we go through a, a consent process, we actually have invested a lot on the validation of the systems to ensure that when we're collecting the data, it's in one place, it's stored, and it's quality data, which is critical when we're now using that data to complement a reimbursement submission, a regulatory submission. But going into the safety data, because we're touching the patient at various aspects of their patient journey, we collect a lot of safety data too. So not just on the commercial side, but on the safety side, adverse events that are then reported to Health Canada, including side effect management and adherence, things like that. So this is critical, um, you know, examples of how we can collect through the patient journey and track a patient at every step. We then, of course, balance that with other data sources, which are, a lot of our speakers have already spoken about, whether it's connecting to disease registries, connecting to other pharmacies, hospitals, medical records, Tara spoke about that. So there's a variety of different data outside of the patient support program. So if there's any gaps, certainly we can plug in to other systems. And that leads us into how we can generate the evidence that these stakeholders and the HTA are looking for. Um, and I'll give you some examples in a few moments of how we've been able to illustrate the value of a, pro, of a drug in the real world setting to address the burden of illness. We have a lot of um, companies that come to us that are launching a new drug. Um, it's an unmet need and there's no, there's no evidence to quantify what that unmet need is. That, that's what the kind of data we can leverage from the patient support program or even just a budget impact assessment or even a listing agreement, an outcomes-based agreement. There's a lot of data that we generate through the program that we can then utilize special tools that can compile that information and then report it back to the payer. We are investing quite a bit on digital tools specifically to collect this data. Because there's so many different data sources, um, we do have systems that plug into different sources. If we go to the next slide, Bill, I'll give you some examples of, of what that looks like. These are just at the top, you see the different steps of how we follow a patient when they're enrolled into a program. Um, we enroll them, we collect their consent, we then follow them as they get their first dose, we deliver it, and then we, we follow up with them. Um, even when they're discontinued, they're still enrolled in the program. We have systems like uh, you know, CRMs and different PLA trackers, PLA navigator that can track the outcomes throughout. A lot of payers have different types of PLAs. We're able to track um, and utilize those tools to track them throughout their journey. And on the bottom, it gives you some examples of the types of data we're able to track through the program, starting at basic baseline information, um, baseline characteristics, age you know, to address who are these patients, what is their profile, and then to actually going into the patterns, because we're able to track when the patient started, when they dropped off, if they were adherent, we, we even go down to the delivery times of the drugs if we're dispensing it through our pharmacy. So you see some examples um, even of healthcare, healthcare uh, resource utilization or societal uh, uh, types of data. 
In addition to that basic data, because we see these patients in our clinics, in some cases we're administering the product, we actually have nurses working with our patients. We can even implement other types of data sets like a quality of life questionnaire, um, validated questionnaires and health studies, where we can actually collect the labs and then also collect the actual patient reported outcomes. So there's different ways we can complement that throughout. And we even have an app that patients can input their information to that it can be fed into our back end system. So, you know, and it just a, maybe I'll, I'll end with an example. We have a lot of examples of tracking outcomes based agreement, but we also have just as a high level, you know, a manufacturer had developed a new formulation of their product. Um, it was a new formulation, it was intended to replace an off label use of an existing treatment. Um, to obtain the reimbursement of that new formulation, the HTA agencies required that manufacturer to provide real world evidence of the current use of their off label product to reflect that actual Canadian treatment pattern and real world utilization. So the evidence that we collected through the patient program, we were able to collect the data, analyze the data, and then provide it to, to the HTA so that they could understand what the real world prescription practices look like, the utilization, but it was also that it been able to feed into an economic model that the HTA group uh, re reviewed. And we leveraged the data from the PSP. So we were able to collect dosing and frequencing data, uh, you know, volume trend, historical and future projection, as well as patient surveys and physician surveys and, and, and chart audits to complement, to, to really illustrate what that real world looked like. So there's, this is just one little example. There's a lot of other examples of how we've been able to prospectively plan these things out through the patient program from the beginning when we're designing it, but even retrospectively, because we've collected data in the past, sometimes we get manufacturers who are coming to us later who are reaching you know, barriers or challenges with HTA, we're able to go back into the systems, collect, you know, leverage, analyze the data, and then come up with some robust solutions. So again, data can be collected in different ways, but we certainly encourage uh, a proactive approach to this and recognizing that the PSP is one part of a larger ecosystem of data as, we, as we've spoken about, but it has a lot of rich data that certainly can be leveraged um, to, to answer those research questions that we've been, we've been speaking about. That, thank you so much, Sandra, and I'm keep the chat going, uh, contribute to that. One question that I want to come back to at some point, and maybe we'll do it in the case studies is, what's the role for artificial intelligence? Because you're talking about um, data collection, you know, how to use digital tools, tools to collect the data, but then what do you do with it? And are we talking today about systems that will be, you know, completely taken over in the future by um, a, you know, computing capacity that will be able to, to look at chart data to, to, you know, get out the noise and really tone it. And maybe this is going back in a good segue, actually, to, to some of the payer perspectives. And we'll get Lori to back, tag, tag back in here. Um, you know, let's prepare for the future. But maybe, maybe Brad, I'm going to throw it to you. Um, get you, if you can, pretend to put that payer hat back on your head. What are the kinds of questions you would, you would have if somebody like Sandra or or Tara come to you and say, "Hey, what do you think about this, you know, proposed adjunct to a potential reimbursement deal from from a company? Like, what what are the things that a payers uh, think think about in, in these situations?" Yeah, thanks, Bill, for that. Um, you know, the the lead into the payer perspective talked about what's the value and what are the challenges. Brad, you just froze. But oh, many of the things that I believe would be important to payers, and, and of course there's a difference between public and private uh, decision makers, has, has already been kind of touched on by the other folks in the panel. Um, so I'm gonna turn off my camera just to... How are we doing for audio, Brad? Are you still, still with us? It? Yeah, I can hear you. Perfect, yeah, we can hear you loud and clear. We know you're there, keep on going. Okay, all right. Um, so, you know, Bill, your leading question is, is what do the payers kind of uh, think about when, our, when they're approached by, by a situation um, about using real world evidence, real world data to help support a reimbursement decision? 
And I think at a high level, a couple of things that generally go through the payer's mind, and it doesn't matter really public or private. Number one is, okay, in a particular disease state, what are truly, truly, truly the outcomes that are important to patients, to their families, to their caregivers, to their clinicians? Um, you know, because payers are not necessarily have deep expertise in, in the disease state. Uh, and really don't always know. And in particular, you know, when we're talking about rare disease uh, conditions, sometimes there's a lot less um, in, in, the, in the evidence, in the literature that speaks to, uh, you know, uh, the outcomes and their importance. And of course, you know, there's, there's uh, importance as measured in a, in a clinical trial or from a statistical standpoint, but there's absolutely, uh, outcomes as measured by patient reported factors. So, so that's often a big question, you know, what's really important? Can we objectively measure it? And is there a way in which to kind of correlate what we can objectively measure with the intervention that we're talking about, you know, with that, with that patient's quality of life? Um, the second thing that probably pops into a payer's mind is, okay, uh, there's been lots of comment about data, the various sources, the inability to kind of knit that data together. Uh, the, you know, and those, those challenges certainly exist within the payer system as well. Um, you know, even in private payer scenarios where you have insurance providers that might have um, administrative data and records on a variety of uh, elements health, uh, the ability to, to stitch those things together and really look at a patient's overall health perspective, you know, longitudinally, but also at a point in time uh, is challenging. And in the public system, absolutely challenging uh, to break through some of the, the barriers and some of the silos that exist within, you know, the, the public system. Um, you know, generally folks who make reimbursement decisions for drugs uh, they can have access to administrative type data and their own claim system, but beyond that, it's really, really challenging. So, you know, th that's a real uh, uh, consideration and a real challenge to supporting some of those decisions. But even when, when potential solutions are brought forward, um, you know, involving other, other parties, it's not a simple matter of just connecting the dots and saying, ah, yes, um, you know, supporting a reimbursement uh, decision using data that comes from a PSP or from a registry or from other sources, even, even other public sources. It, it's not as simple as just identifying what you're going to measure and where you're going to get the data. There's also a need to be able to kind of validate and verify that from an internal audit standpoint, right? Particularly when we're speaking about spending public funds. Um, you know, there's lots of checks and balances that are required. And you know the the infrastructure and the in investment that might be required to uh, to build that type of infrastructure is is often something that's kind of beyond the purview of any one uh, decision maker within a, a health system. Um, so you know lots of challenges, but but the other thing that I wanted to touch on briefly, and I want to keep this on time here, is that the the payer experience with real world evidence is not zero. I, I would suggest that it is still very early days and still very fundamental. And perhaps uh, the experience to date has been more around real world data versus truly real, real world evidence. Um, you know, if we're talking about reimbursement, uh, ultimately we're talking about using public funds uh, that are limited and therefore prioritization decisions need to be made. Uh, so there's a, a certain substantiation that has to um, back up every decision to invest those public funds. Um, it's, it's a little bit easier when you're talking about reimbursement if the outcomes that you measure are administrative uh, and can be found in claims data. So stops and starts and other things that are typically kind of observable in the data. It becomes much more challenging to bring in other clinical outcomes which, which would be tracked in other systems. Uh, but there are, um, probably less than a handful of examples where there have been agreements struck at a national level through PCPA and a manufacturer 
to utilize um, more clinical outcome data to help support and administer reimbursement decisions. And I think there's kind of a, you know, although it's still not without its challenges, there's a bit of a, a perfect scenario which lends itself to this. Uh, number one is a relatively small, specialized and engaged clinician community and relatively small, predictable numbers of patients, right? Um, it just becomes a little bit more challenging to manage, particularly um, when many of the, um, the negotiations and the decisions are made at, at that national level, bringing together all the public payers. Um, th there's a need to, to make sure that we've got the right people around the table kind of informing on what are the outcomes, how can they be measured, how can they be tracked, evaluated and aggregated to maintain uh, privacy of all those involved. And, you know, not even touching on kind of the, the management of the risk and the financial piece. Um, really what we're, you know, the, the public system, I think, needs to, needs to be able to rely on is other um, agencies, right? So, you know, CADETH is, is relied upon to be the body, and INS, of course, as well, to evaluate the evidence. And I think the, the public system uh, and the payers that represent it would say, you know, we as a group are not really in the business of evaluating that evidence. So uh, undoubtedly for anything to have uh, success kind of at that national level, uh, there would have to be a way to, um, for the decision makers to come together and rely on uh, a body such as Cadeth INS to really help uh, with, with the development of and generation of, and then the ongoing kind of tracking and management of real world evidence. So Thank, we'll thanks, and, Brett. Oh. That, that's terrific. Um, and one thing I'll just take from that, it goes back to what you said earlier, Craig, about qualification. Maybe it's, it's there's qualification of evidence, but there may be qualifications of systems. Do you know what I mean? For gathering evidence. So yes, certified evidence gathering system, as opposed to this evidence is decision grade awesomeness. Um, we should jump to the case studies. Uh, Durhan, do you want rapid fire? Uh, we've got some amazing panelists. Keep the chat going on this. We've got four case studies. Do you want to walk us through which ones? And we can think about the kind of where RWE might work for two or three of them at least. Uh, we've got a hard stop in 21 minutes. Yeah, we're just on time, so I'm thrilled about that. Can you stick them up there? Um, sure, I will uh, track them we have down. Them yeah. I would like, to, uh, yeah, I love to, I know that we could just have open commentary and uh, I was almost going to suggest that, you know, we would ask each panelist to respond to something of interest that they heard from the other panelists, but let's use the case studies as a context for that if we can. So really the question here is wide open, you know, uh, and these are real scenarios that you've all talked about. How do you think real world data, real world evidence could be used in this situation with the ultimate goal? Okay, let me keep you focused on what the goal is. The goal is to get the right drug to the right patient at the most timely point possible. Okay, so making sure that we can do that. All right, so we've got a first in class new therapy for a previously untreated condition. Now keep it in rare, could be ultra rare. Um, so we've got a new drug coming in. You can imagine that the scenario is that there probably were, you know, maybe, um, uh, you know, phase two, phase three clinical trials, don't know. Obviously, you're not going to have a huge, you know, thousands of people that were involved in it. But what we've done is that this is the first drug for this condition. And, you know, it could be a very serious condition. It could be something that's not so serious. Where and how would you want to, uh, to use real world evidence here? I can start if you want. It's Laurie here. Sure. Yeah, 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 um, Laurie. Go. Oh. So I right away, and I feel like this is often forgotten, but it's just so important. Even if there's no treatment, we can still find out, well, who are the patients that have this disease? You know, where do they live? How old are they? What's, where, where do they get their care now? Is it in a big hospital? So, you know, we can have the patient journey, the care pathway, who are the clinicians? 
what are the outcomes right now? So there's so much we can find out and learn that helps us evaluate any new treatment going forward. So when do you think we should start to put together? I'm really, um, maybe I want to get to Tara as well, because Tara mentioned something that I almost found chilling, but I'm sure she meant it well. And that is that, you know, we need to collect and to be able to use this real world evidence in a research protocol, in a research environment. So when do you think we need to set this up? Anybody, you know, um, maybe I'm looking at Craig, quite frankly. <laughs> well, you know, that, I mean, you know, I would be excited to see scenarios where, you know, we, as a rare disease community, where, you know, we're using, you know, um, what's starting to develop in terms of, you know, potential new therapies and saying, oh, we got to, you know, get on a, you know, a real world evidence um, a, a solution for that disease, because, you know, we're going to need the information that comes from there through the whole you know, development cycle, right? From, you know, as Laurie said, sort of even understanding where people are to clinical trial planning, outcome measurements, uh, you know, in, in the real world context. I mean, something we, I've, I saw a little bit about patient reported outcomes, but motor outcomes or other, you know, obstacles. And then, you know, ultimately what treatment responsiveness is. So it'd be nice to see seed grants go in to help uh, some of these disease communities start up uh, these vehicles right away when, when we think a drug's gonna to come to fruition. Han, I just, maybe if I could just comment um, to that as well. Um, I think that this needs to start way sooner than the way it starts now, right? Right now we're collecting real world evidence when the criteria is already being decided through the payer and it's an HTA timeframe, I believe it needs to start in the regulatory timeframe. I believe that if if we can, it's almost like that managed access model that we've been speaking about. If there was a way to have conditional access at the beginning, right when Health Canada approves that it's safe, that it's effective, then you start building the evidence soon, as opposed to waiting for regulatory and then HTA to take place. So is it, can we do them concomitantly? Can we build the evidence that then, that then forms the criteria, not build the criteria based on the clinical trial data, but actually collect the real world evidence that will shape the criteria. And then you can track it and, and get the, you know, what the data is ongoing. Because I feel like right now the challenge is we're, we're almost doing it a bit backwards. We're waiting for the payer to make the decision design the criteria and then we're collecting the real world evidence but the real world evidence we collect might actually be a very different um, thing than what the criteria was negotiated earlier so I just feel like there's an opportunity to do it sooner in the process. I, I, Tara. <laughs> I'd be even more controversial uh, and say way earlier than that. Um, the, the clients that are coming to us now used to be a year or two before uh, reimbursement because they were, as you say, Sandra, just looking to fill in the gaps, you know, for their reimbursement submission. We're now seeing people come to us three to five years out. We're seeing early product development planning exactly for what Lori was saying, especially for first in class treatment. What does the patient population look like? You don't have to wait till you're through phase two or even phase three clinical trials, usually in the preclinical phase, early trial development, early product development, rather, you can start looking at a whole bunch of these outcomes. And one of the advantages of doing that is that you can then plan, well, what's practical to put into a clinical trial, what is not, and then you can do concurrent real world evidence and clinical trial outcome collection and just expedite the whole process. But I also think this does take a lot of collaboration. If you're goal is to get the drug onto market, you need to have all the stakeholders involved in those earlier phases as well. And, you know, hopefully things like the scientific advice, you know, processes and other types of engagement with, with payers and stakeholders, you know, can take place earlier as well. Um, because we also have that frustration of, of doing things and then finding out, oh, this isn't what they wanted. And you're kind of thinking it would be nice to be able to get that engagement earlier on. But I honestly think, you know, much earlier this can be done, um, especially if it's a new class. So, Bill, can we segue to the next one? Because I think we can build on the, some of the answers that we've heard. Absolutely. You know. Case okay, two. so, yeah, this is something I'm sure, you know, everybody's had some experience with. So we've got an existing therapy, so it's not a first, in, you know, first treatment, but it's a significant improvement, whatever significant means. Um, 
you know, what about uh, real world evidence? Does it make sense? Do we set it up? When do we set it up? And how would we use that information um, to make a decision about who should get access and whether it's working? Well, I can start again to say really <laughs> a similar comment, but right, we need to know and often we don't know, well, for the existing therapy, who's using it, where are they using it, how often, right? And then is this new therapy going to be used in the same place and whatever? So we need to know as much as we can about the standard of care now so we can evaluate the value of anything new. So that's the starting point for me again. Laurie, does that sort of speak to what Craig was saying earlier? And I know, Craig, you're probably going to jump in around a therapeutic area as opposed to a drug uh, or, or a drug or therapy specific. Uh, exactly, program. right? Craig, I don't yeah. know if you want to and, jump in and, here. And we know new drugs are going to come, right? There's always going to be, you know, I was much more in the world of devices, but we learn and we get better. So we need to expect that there's going to be an evolution and innovation in treatments. So we need to follow what's there so we can measure is, is this better or not? And is it better for everyone or is it better for a particular population of patients? Yeah, absolutely. I agree with Lori um, there. I mean, and also, of uh, course, in the rare disease world, there's also, you know, all sorts of other complementary and alternative, you know, medications that you don't often get a view into how those are at play in clinical trial situations. I mean, obviously, we'd all love a, a, a comparative clinical trial to be done with any new therapy, but, you know, that's a big um, thing to tackle uh, as well in the rare, but at least the real world evidence can give you that. And, and also, you know, uh, I think um, it also helps. One of the things we don't realize is, is it gives us some insight into how patients are choosing the existing therapy. I think we all get this nervousness that uh, everyone's going to go on these expensive new drugs and stay on them forever. But, you know, we know patients and clinicians are making very thoughtful decisions together. And it's, and it's interesting to see actually who is staying on these, where the benefit is, is and that helps us to understand where the gaps are for new therapies that come in uh, as well. So that's one slice we should, I think, look at more often in uh, RWE situations. And just to add to that, I think when you say significant improvement, do you mean statistically significant or clinically significant, right? Like, mm -hmm. is, is this improvement, what does that it actually mean to, to patients and potentially caregivers? So we've done projects in this where looking at, you know, the PROs and the caregiver uh, feedback around those improvements has been so meaningful because, you know, the numbers in terms of, you know, if it's efficacy or, or safety it can still look good if it's a significant improvement, but finding out how that translates to the, the patient perspective and or the caregiver perspective um, is really meaningful. And, and that's a, obviously a form of real world evidence as well by collecting that type of uh, data and information to inform the decision makers around the value of it. If I could just add, yeah, sorry, go on, Drew. No, no, go ahead, Sandra. I was, I was just going to say, you. yeah, the, the baseline uh, information on the previous therapy, you could, we can hopefully get from public sources, but I believe through patient support program data, patient survey data, working with ad, with advocacy groups to define the significance. The significant improvement is another way to get, you know, why this new therapy is such a, a great therapy compared to the baseline. And so I think that there's an opportunity to take those two data sets and compare to quantify the significance. We, we do have a lot of experience working with the patient groups um, to define what it, what is quality mean, what is significant, what is value, and that's an opportunity to, to be able to add some more color to the data to be able to quantify it as well. Now, I was going to throw you guys a nuance. So what if we don't have what we call statistically significant improvement from a clinical outcome point of view, but we do have uh, improvement in terms of quality of life. So the mode of, you know, of uh, administration may be such that, you know, it's much better for the patient. So really quick examples that we've got a, you know, therapy for high cholesterol that, you know, alternative could be going from a, you know, a, 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 a injection, you know, or infusion uh, every other week or twice a week to something that's twice a year. So the outcomes are not necessarily going to be different. Um, do we need to 
you know, kind of wait until we've got real world evidence in terms of that kind of uh, impact on quality of life before we make it available? Or can we actually set it up in such a way that we can collect the information on a go forward basis? Well, for sure, Durhain, like I was saying, for HTA, that is exactly the type of thing that HTA would look at, right? It's it's not only, it's it's what's the impact on patients. So for sure, those are things that can be looked at, but can we measure those things in a way that's standardized, right? That That's the key. Is it convincing to all the stakeholders that, that yes, this is a meaningful difference, right? I, I think that that point is very important. I think it's the patient's story and the impact to the patient life that determines what's the, what, what is the data sets that we're collecting. I, and so even during the clinical study phases, talking to a patient, hearing the impact of an infusion versus, or, you know, an oral versus an infusion or the frequency of the dose or the painfulness of the needle going into their daughter, that's 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 a very important um, statistics and data that we should be tracking early on. So I think partnering with the patient um, and including the patient voice sooner in the journey and making it part of the HTA and regulatory process is critical to be able to quantify the value of a product because uh, you know it can also affect adherence. It can affect health outcomes. If the if the drug is difficult to administer, if it's painful to administer, if there's side effects that are huge then maybe the patient won't respond or won't take the drug. So I think that having the patient voice as part of that is really, really important from the beginning. Bill, can I, um, can I kind of introduce something else? Of course, we, we can move off case studies. We, we just keep an eye on the clock there. And uh, yeah. I, I've got this great group of experts that I've been really dying to ask somebody this question. So from a patient perspective, we think of real world data, real world evidence, much more qualitatively, right? We think of it as, in fact, the patient experience in a real life. I mean, it could also include some of the biometric kinds of uh, measurements, right? So, but that is not oftentimes kind of what people are thinking about. And oftentimes those could be things that are in, Craig, you know, in physician's record. So you're interviewing the patient, you've got a bunch of notes in there. It goes back to what you were talking about, Bill, is where's the role of AI? And Lori did some great, or somebody else did some great job. No, Tyra, I think, did some, uh, you know, explanations in terms of how these algorithms could change, you know, freeform text into evidence. But patients actually are quite frustrated a lot of times, even in the submissions into the HDA, because we think we're giving you great qualitative information and the challenge of subsuming them into some quantitative measures seems to not actually capture what it is that we're saying. What we can understand from an evaluator's or an assessor's point of view, and maybe Brad, you can comment on this, is that how do you take what feels like squishy information and use it to make any kinds of decisions around what the impact is in terms of uh, the patients. I mean, we get it in terms of adverse effects, but we don't necessarily get it in terms of what that impact is in terms of improvements on quality of life, et cetera. So, you know, how do we go from that or do we have to always translate it into some kind of a quantitative measure? I think under the current system and the way it's been, you know, uh, designed and implemented, the, the general payer perspective um, would be well, we rely on CADF and other HTA agencies to factor in all, all uh, considerations, right? So clinical, economic, patient, societal, implementation, all those types of things. Um, so, you know, in my personal opinion, the patient reported outcome and the impact on quality of life and not just life of the patient, but families, caregivers and others tends to get kind of a short and rely on those things that can be objectively measured, right? And because it is a little squishy, as you say, Durhan, it's hard to, it's hard to kind of put that in perspective. Um, you know, the, the answer is not easy or simple, uh, but, you know, even comparing kind of the, uh, the, the CADIS versus INES system in terms of their own framework, I think that there are other models that, that can be utilized where, where those impacts on patients, their families, caregivers, and the societal perspective, the greater good, 
We're, we're losing you, Brad. Maybe I can toss it. Yeah, I can toss it to Tara. Tara, maybe you, I know you do a lot in terms of being able to aggregate, you know, mm -hmm. uh, these kinds of uh, data and evidence. What's your sense? Of how would you, how do you do that? You know, this kind yeah. of information. We, we, we typically recommend using validated tools. Um, so the patient experience um, and patient reported outcomes is, is extremely important. It does get woven into cost effectiveness modeling as well. Um, but typically you need um, a, a standardized tool to really create that robustness around those outcomes. It's not great. I mean, the free text comments are usually so informative. So it, it's a frustrating, you know, aspect to not be able to pick up on, you know, some of that information that isn't captured through those standardized tools. But there's a lot of tools that are for specific diseases that really do try and get after like what's important to patients. And by doing it through a standardized tool, you're asking the same question in the same way to every patient. And so that then allows you to sort of aggregate that data and sometimes even, even transform it because sometimes Sometimes there is like on a one to 10 scale, like how do you feel or how is this particular um, aspect of your disease affected you? And then you can use that for your cost effectiveness modeling and things like that. So I hear the frustration on how do you create an opportunity for patient feedback to be taken on board and, and listened to. And I think what I've seen where we are right now is really using those standardized surveys, those standardized tools for measuring it. That's to, in my mind, I think probably the best method we have at this time which most patients would probably feel are woefully lacking. So exactly. I think we need to come yes. back to it. I mean, I hear you and we yeah. understand that. I think there's a lot of um, appeal around things like the AI that Bill was talking about. Can we take these, you know, even, you know, when create, you know, the physician note, can we take them and apply algorithms to them? Can we pull out that information and then begin to get a picture in terms of what patients are saying? So mm -hmm. I think it's trying to go the other way around as well. But again, many of these AI tools are probably not yet reliable enough, not standardized enough, et cetera, et cetera. So I think it's something we need to work toward, but I hear very much what you're mm -hmm. saying. Yeah. Nice. Bill, I, I think we're going to run out of time. So I'm going to toss it back to you. Thanks so much. And I will just um, resume share right now because we've got today's slides. They will be available on uh, Cord's slide share and YouTube channel, the, the full recording. Um, thank you, everyone, especially, you know, in, in, in the chat group and the dialogue. This has been exceptional. We, we had a huge turnout and that just shows how interested and important uh, this, this topic is. Um, and I think we've just scratched the surface with a few different ideas. Um, I would like at some point, and I don't know, Durham will take this offline, but, you know, to, to go right into case studies um, and maybe even see some of the data um, in therapeutic areas, because it, we, 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 talk, we talk a little bit around it and like, you know, a million people in this database over here, or here's how a, a PSP could be, a patient support program could be set up, uh, you know, but what does it actually look like in reality when somebody enters in their data? How is that used when it's after it's in a database? Um, so this has been a great primer, I think, for a lot of people with some amazing ideas in the chat. So let's take this offline. Let's, let's use our own AI to go through the chat for some evidence there and figure out next steps for how CORD can come forward with, uh, with more dialogue like this. Yeah, so let me very quickly jump in exactly what you're saying. We would really love your feedback. We don't do a formal evaluation on these, but anybody that would like to send us some stuff to our info line, what you like, what you don't like, what you see as some of the topics we need to address when we start to talk about using, you know, the uh, real world evidence in terms of decision making for rare disease drugs, how should that be embedded in our rare disease drug strategy? The other thing I'll say very quickly, Lori, uh, you know, um, there is a forum that's going to be taking place that is hosted by um, CIHR, by CADF, and by CORD on real world evidence on the 6th and 7th, yes, of, um, of October. And we do have space for 10 patients. I wanted to do this, and the reason we were rushing to do this at this point is that we would love to see, you know, get some awareness out there, some education out there to really try to invite 10 people who would like to join it. So if you are a patient advocate and you would like to participate in this forum that's coming up and you can spare the time, it is a two and a half hour commitment on each day, send me a note 
uh, send you know quote a note and let us know and we will see if we can you know get you at the table there I know there's some great patient advocates on online here right now um, and then look forward to you know send us some ideas look forward to the next step and we will do more of these and as Bill says give us some ideas in terms of topics and also in terms of formats that you would like to see so thank you folks so very much huge thanks to Bill for really moderating us through this and obviously a huge thanks to all of our panelists you guys were just superb in terms of not only your presentations but the discussion and certainly the contributions to the chat we will capture actually the chat information and we will be able to post that as well so there's great nuggets in there that um, we didn't get a chance to talk about so huge thanks again and um, the bad news is that i'll probably call upon all these panelists again to join us as we look at the next phase of this so appreciate it so much.